Making a let's play is a little like riding a go-kart down a mountain. It's a good idea to plan the start and have a fairly accurate idea of where you're going to end, but you also need to be ready for the moment the steering wheel breaks and you're hurtling down the mountain with no idea where you're going to end, just hoping against all hope that you survive the impact. Phase 2. Leonard Thane of Everywhere. My name's Leonard, and I am a hero. I said, I'm a hero. Hello? H hello? Hello? Excuse me? Can you hear me? stage of Leonard's story spans chapters 3 to 6 and involves Leonard's quest to acquire influence in the polite society of Skyrim. He's already gained influence in the nefarious criminal organizations, he's now amassed a small fortune, and he feels ready to hit high society and gain power and status there. His plan is really quite simple. He's going to use his new wealth to acquire properties around Skyrim. Because if you have money, acquisition of land and properties is probably one of the better ways to acquire status in society, becoming part of the owner class. And so, of course, he sets out to impress the Jarls and nobles of the courts that he should be allowed to buy properties within the city limits, and he decides that he needs some sort of cover story, some sort of um, occupation that presents him in a good light. And seeing as he's been working for the museum, and sort of in a way as part owner, he presents himself as this relic hunter for the museum. It, it gives a sort of sense of academia, of being a scholar at the same time as being an adventurer. Of course, Leonard is none of those things, but he doesn't mind faking it, lying, to give the impression of someone who is useful, uh, perhaps a little daring and exciting, but also a gentleman, a gentleman of means, of learning. Of course, this is Skyrim, and uh, they only seem to respect people who can go out and thump people that need thumping, and thus Leonard ends up finding himself being sent here and there on various dangerous and, shall we say, uh, demeaning tasks. Is this a Nord thing? We don't sell houses to rich people until they've proved they can murder people for us. I mean, he really doesn't see himself as someone who should be out there killing bandits for the Jarl, but if that's what he's got to do, he will do it. This is also the phase where Leonard finds out about Thane ships. After acquiring a house, he can do a few more tasks, favours for the people of a city or a hold, and he can be granted an honorary title. This title doesn't come with any real tangible benefits beyond granting him extra respect, and of course, uh, he will be given a little more leeway, a little privilege, by the guards. This, of course, is exactly what Leonard is looking for. This is exactly what he wants, and thus he now becomes obsessed with becoming the Thane of everywhere. Interestingly enough, I don't think I really understood the impact that the Thane ships were going to have on Leonard's story when I, when I started. When I was planning chapter three, what I was looking for was some way to get Leonard outside of his current comfort zone, because of course, he was now a master thief, a master assassin, he'd been very city focused, but to do anything else in Skyrim, to continue his story, I was going to need him to really venture to places where he would not voluntarily go unless he had a massively good reason to. The houses were an obvious reason, it's, it, it pretty much wrote itself, so to speak, 
and I was aware of the Thane ships, but it hadn't sort of hit me. I hadn't realised until I started playing as Leonard and heard the Jarl talk about it and think, yes, yes, I need that. And I think this highlights something that's going to come up quite a lot, where I plan things for Leonard as gopher, but I sometimes don't thoroughly understand how Leonard is going to react until I'm playing Leonard and I'm in the situation and I've let the character take over. And there are times, actually, where Leonard's reaction has been unexpected, where I was not ready for it because I'd underestimated a certain side of Leonard, which I know sounds weird. I created the character, but sometimes when you judge the character from the outside, even if you're the creator of it, you're not thinking as the character. And this is one of those cases. The Thane ships just became a sort of a linchpin for the entire playthrough. And this is part of the reason Leonard was so much fun to play, because he allowed me to see Skyrim in a whole new way, to experience aspects of it that I really hadn't cared to experience before. All of my previous characters, whether they be, you know, Let's Plays or normal playthroughs, had pretty much ignored the Thane ships and indeed not really even engaged in the house purchasing side of things. I don't know how many houses I had bought in previous playthroughs, but it wasn't many. I definitely hadn't bought all of them. I certainly hadn't touched Hearthfire. And to have a character who wanted all of them, well, it just it opened up whole new possibilities and a whole new way of looking at Skyrim. Now, of course, most of the tasks he gets in this particular phase are not going to be based in the city, as as was the case in chapters one and two, where he was, you know, predominantly a thief. He has to adapt to the new reality that he is going to spend an awful lot of time outside in Skyrim. He needs to change his attire accordingly. So instead of wearing very light, thievy appropriate attire, he's got to wear things that are perhaps a little tougher, will perhaps protect him more, both from the elements, the dirt, and of course, the occasional blow. Now, at this phase, I still feel like Leonard was a mostly mundane character, in that his skill set was still predominantly thievery, poison, and of course, Inigo. He was a superb thief, and his poisons were devastating, even from the start of this particular phase, but they were still, you know, those were his go-to moves. And whilst towards the end of this phase, he did begin to use a little more magic, it was mostly performative. And by that I mean he was casting spells less to have an effect, less to get an objective done, and more to make everyone think that he was something that he wasn't. He wanted to appear like he was a battle mage who was helping, when in reality, he was just trying to find a way to stay at the back, not get hurt, but have people see him and think he was there. So whilst he was using magic, and the magic was real, it was just part of the con. It was yet another Leonard-type trick that he was playing on people, a role that he'd adopted. But he was using real magic, and of course he had learned and used a few spells for convenience as well. He was using magic in the most Leonard-like way possible, to fake and to make life a little easier on himself. And so when I think of these four chapters and the tools that Leonard was generally focusing on, I feel like they pretty much remain the same as the first two chapters being thievery, poison, and inigo, but now he'd added manipulation to his arsenal. He was basically running a con in chapter three, chapter four, and indeed chapter six. He was playing a role to get people to think certain things to climb the social ladder. The main challenges he still had for these chapters still involved not getting caught, when, you know, trying to be stealthy, but it now also involved not getting found out. He didn't, he didn't want people to realize 
he was a total fraud. However, I now want to move on from the challenges that Leonard faced to the challenges that I faced, the things that I had to overcome during this phase, and I'm going to start with chapter three. Most of this chapter was actually relatively smooth sailing. I don't remember many problems or issues that I had to deal with, and it kind of just flowed naturally. The problem was I wasn't sure how to end the chapter. I, I didn't know where it should end, and more specifically, I didn't know what the next chapter was going to involve. You see, chapter three was all about getting properties and becoming the Thane of the holds, but we all know that you can't become the Thane of every single hold without doing certain other key bits of content. For example, with Windhelm, you have to do the Civil War, and I really didn't think that was going to be the next chapter, and of course it was not going to be part of the third chapter. That's a chapter in its own right. There is also the problem of White Run, which does require that you unlock the dragons. And that was something I just didn't want to do at this point. I, I really wanted to keep that mundane feeling. But honestly, I was beginning to feel like I had no choice. The Dragonborn DLC was definitely an option. It was something I was planning on playing with Leonard. Actually, originally, I was planning on going the vampire route with him. I thought his personality would suit that path. I will talk about that a little more in this video. Uh, but for now, what I will say is I was reluctant to start that DLC at this stage because I felt like becoming a vampire was a massive power spike for a character like Leonard. You know, for where he was at that point, becoming a vampire lord was a major power boost. And let's face it, it's also changing him from being quite mundane, quite ordinary in some respects, to being quite extraordinary. And so I really wasn't keen on doing that at this point either. There was also the Mages College in Winterhold, but this didn't feel right either, because Leonard really didn't have any reason to go to the college. He wasn't a wizard, he had no real interest in magic. I did think to myself that I might join the college after becoming a vampire, because of course becoming a vampire involves getting access to some more magic, and this might make him more interested in exploring that side of things. So that was one of the potential future chapters, it just didn't feel like something Leonard would do right now. I did consider installing some modded content, but of course that is a great unknown. I've no idea how well that will fit into the story I'm trying to tell, so I did want to mostly focus on the vanilla content. Of course I had the Museum, the Legacy of the Dragonborn mod installed, that adds some new quests, some new content, but it's all very much based around Skyrim, so I felt pretty safe on that. Although, at this point, those quests were stalled because I'd not unlocked the dragons. I don't know if I knew that at this point. Somebody did inform me of that, but, but that was the case, so th there were no quests there either. So my options really were dragons, the Civil War, the Dawnguard DLC, or the College of Winterhold. Of course, the College of Winterhold I'd already dismissed because Leonard didn't really have the incentive to go there. The Civil War would have been a problem because it would have meant Leonard was trying to become the Thane of Windhelm before becoming the Thane of Whiterun. And that just felt wrong. I don't think I could have actually sold that one as believable. I don't, I don't think anyone would buy that. It was the last hold Leonard decided to become the Thane of for a reason. Both, both Leonard and Inigo hate the place. So it basically came down to dragons versus Dawnguard as a vampire. But there was one other factor that was swaying me here. There were a couple of things in Fort Dawnguard, at least one of them for the museum. And I needed to collect that to continue on with the collection quests there. And I'd been putting it off for a while because I sort of knew that 
that would almost certainly trigger the Dawn Guard quest. And I didn't want to put it off for too long because it would become really obvious that that's what I was doing. And so I thought to myself, you know what, let's just go with the incentives that are there. Leonard already has an incentive to go to the fort and try to find one of these artifacts. And whilst he's there, if he happens to overhear a conversation that triggers the Dawnguard quest, and I was pretty sure that that was what was going to happen, that just seemed to be natural, I would then just go along with the Dawnguard DLC and... My thought process on this was that I would end it just as Leonard got turned into a vampire. Most of you already know, if you've watched the series, that's not what happened. You see, here's how I figured this would um, play out when I was thinking of this in advance. This is how I imagined it would go. Leonard would meet Serana and would be very impressed because she fits his stereotypical idea of what a vampire should be. She's classy, beautiful, powerful. She gives off this feeling of confidence and style. And so he would be, you know, suitably impressed by her. They would then go back to the castle and meet Harkon, who again gives off this aristocratic vibe. Harkon would be grateful and would offer Leonard the chance to join this aristocracy. Of course, this is really going to appeal to Leonard because not only is it aristocratic, it's also immortal aristocracy. So he's almost certainly going to say yes. Then Harkon would step forward, reveal his true form and embrace Leonard. And the, the chapter would end with Leonard screaming no as he realized what he'd done. And so I thought chapter four was going to be Leonard trying to deal with the fact that he's now a pantless gargoyle and also having to deal with the feeding aspect of being a vampire. Because I did, I did figure that he would get over his natural squeamishness regarding blood. He's a vampire now. He's probably going to find that quite appealing. But nothing would allow Leonard to get over his squeamishness of revolting people. Uh, there's, there's no way he would be wanting to feed off an unshaven sailor or, or a beggar. He would always be insisting on um, feeding on well-to-do damsels in mansions, which of course could have been an interesting challenge for him in of itself. And, and I figured by the end of the chapter, Leonard would be so fed up of the whole vampire thing, he'd seek out the cure, perhaps with Serana. And I've never actually done the cure for vampirism in Skyrim. So that was, you know, I thought, hey, that could be new for me as well. So that was what I was thinking. But of course, that is not what happened. Because Leonard turns up to that castle and it's horrific from the moment he walks through the door. The other vampires seem revolting. They're, they're dressed shabbily. They're covered in blood. The floor is covered in blood. The table's covered in human flesh and blood. It's dark. There are cobwebs. It's horrible. Some of the vampires are eating and making disgusting slurping sounds. They've got no table manners whatsoever. And then, of course, Harkon doesn't reveal himself after you've accepted the gift. He does so beforehand, so you know what you're accepting. And there was just no way... There was no way Leonard was going to say yes. M M I was obviously deep into the Leonard character in that moment, utterly horrified, utterly disgusting, and there was no way Leonard was going to say yes. And and whilst I was screaming no to Harkon, my inner voice, the gopher inside, was going, oh, what am I going to do now? Because I was totally thrown all of my expectations had been shattered. So, I'm, I mean, I keep going. I keep playing. I keep having the conversation. I say no to him. I, I may have even cut that out, actually, because it was totally and utterly irrelevant at that point. As soon as um, Leonard had seen it, it was obvious the choice was no. And I went outside, and I saved the game, and I thought, God, what am I going to do now? You see, I didn't see Leonard wanting to go back to Fort Dawnguard and report this to um, Isram because he just didn't care. He'd, 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 
He tried to find this artifact. He knew what the artifact was now. It was on Sorana's back. And, you know, his his interest in the Dawn Guard had gone. He was still interested in that artifact, but he wasn't interested in becoming a vampire. So I was pretty much at a loss. And I did consider some options like reloading a save that was quite far back before I even agreed to go and, um, you know, help the Dawn Guard out. I was wondering, could I go and get the artifacts for the museum without triggering that conversation? But every way I considered doing it, just, it felt a bit wrong. It just, it didn't seem right that Leonard wouldn't go in there and then pay attention to that conversation. Um, so I dismissed that. I then wondered, should I reload and maybe redo the conversation? Maybe if I do some machinima, if I, if I have Leonard go in and then I do some cut scene type stuff, the way I do with the, with the preludes, could I make it look like Harkon didn't reveal himself before Leonard said yes, and then, you know, it, it was as I imagined it to be. But of course, the entire setup, the entire place was so revolting and so horrible. I just, I hadn't remembered how hideous it was in there that I just, I couldn't see this being something that appealed to Leonard. And so whilst it really was a pain in the backside for me, I genuinely thought Leonard's reaction, the reaction I had as Leonard at the time, wasn't just the correct one. It, it was it was the only one that made sense for that character and I needed to live with it and, and try to make it work. So, obviously Dawn Guard is not going to be chapter 4, which leaves Unlocking the Dragons as the most likely next chapter. But... I still wasn't 100% sure. I was I was still in this stage where I just, I was having difficulty accepting this. And so I said to myself, well, I don't want to end chapter three here. I can't end chapter three here. And I don't want to just go to White Run now and unlock the dragons and then end it. Just in case over the next few weeks, I have an epiphany and think of something else I can do before unlocking those dragons. So I wanted to find a way to end chapter three on, you know, on a bit of a high note, but in a way that suggested the next place was Whiterun without absolutely committing to it. Now, Leonard did have a few tasks to keep him occupied, including becoming the Thane of Falkreath, because, of course, he already owned land in that hold, so it seemed reasonably natural that he would just get a few tasks done and get the Thane ship there. But after that, it really was time to make a decision. So, I was looking around the map, basically asking myself, where might Leonard want to become the Thane of before Whiterun? Obviously, Windhelm, not an option for the reasons we've already discussed. Dawnstar, it is a port, but honestly, I don't think there's anything important going on there. Morthal is just in a swamp and seems pretty unimportant. And that left Winterhold. But Winterhold is actually quite an interesting hold. Even though it's a very small town, it has the Mages College there. And that is a powerful and important institution. It's also a hold that Leonard has no influence over at all. He does know Enthir, but the Thieves' Guild do not have a foothold there, and he's not the Thane there. Whereas at least with Whiterun, the Thieves' Guild has a good foothold there. So he's already got some influence in Whiterun. He's got none in Winterhold, and that is a, that is, you know, a place filled with powerful people, a powerful institution. It is the sort of place Leonard would enjoy having some sway over. So, of course, Leonard now heads off to Windhold to speak to the Jarl and offer his services in the hope of getting a house and a Thane ship. Except, apparently, I must have selected some dialogue in one of the earlier chapters, probably chapter one, where I'd upset the Jarl because he was not happy with Leonard at all and didn't offer him any tasks. So, I got to Winterhold and I'm like, okay, 
this isn't going to work. Maybe if I do, you know, helpful things for the people of Winterhold the way I did it for other um, holes, it would change the disposition of the Jarl, maybe. I don't think it does, actually. But to be honest, I was, again, a little desperate, a little adrift and unsure of what to do. So I just went into sort of autopilot and ended up trying to get into the college to talk to Enthir. Of course, to get into the college, you have to get past the gatekeeper, Feraldra, who challenges you. Now, Leonard didn't say, oh, I, I'm a wizard, I'm, I want to, 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 to join, um, but rather used his persuasion skills, thinking he was convincing Feraldra to just let him in to visit a friend, and he was successful, but then suddenly Feraldra started to speak to him as though he was a student, and I remember Leonard just turned around to Indigo at some point and said something along the lines of, Okay, I may have just accidentally enrolled in college. And all of a sudden, my brain exploded with Chapter 4. I, I, the, 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 the way Chapter 4 was going to unfold, the prelude, everything, just mapped out ahead of me in a fraction of a second because I suddenly remembered how this quest goes, this first quest. It ends with you in front of Tolfdir having done a lesson with Tolfdir suggesting you go on an archaeological expedition. And I suddenly knew why Leonard would want to stay at the college. But more importantly, I realized Leonard was completely and utterly unprepared to be at the college. He was, let's face it, not remotely magically inclined. He was going to be the worst mage student ever, and he was going to have to fake it. He was going to have to keep pretending to be something he wasn't in a desperate attempt to get whatever relics the Mages Guild were trying to uncover. And I absolutely loved it. I just, I, I, I could see the scenario in my head. Leonard, totally out of his comfort zone, desperately pretending he knew how to cast magic. 